Thank you, Diana and Alan, for serving as co-chairs this evening. And thank you to each of you who've joined us tonight. This really is an incredible turnout, standing room only. We are so delighted to all of you for showing up and our sponsors as well. The Milwaukee Jewish Federation's mission is to ensure that our Jewish community continues to thrive for generations to come. We accomplish this by building our Jewish Community Foundation. With $165 million in assets so far, our foundation will help ensure a financially stable community in the future. We also invest funds today in programs that educate and engage our children, like Jewish Day Schools, BBYO, and Hillel on Campus. We support safety net services, like the Jewish Community Pantry, Jewish Family Services, and the programs for the elderly. We help support a just world by teaching the lessons of the Holocaust and by giving our children the tools to speak out when they see anti-Semitism and other acts of bigotry. And this is just in our own community in Milwaukee. We also provide safety net services for Jews everywhere they live, and we help connect the global Jewish family through programs in Israel. All of this work is founded on Jewish values, including tikkun olam, repair of the world in which we live. Educating the world about the genocide that occurred during World War II is perhaps the most valuable act of repair we can perform. By casting light on the horrors of the Holocaust, we can help create awareness of genocide today. We are witnessing the very same model of mass murder by bullets that took the lives of many of our parents and grandparents. We cannot remain silent, given the history of our own people. Hosting Holocaust by bullets is one way that our community can say, never again. And now it is my pleasure to welcome the President and CEO of the Milwaukee Jewish Federation, Hannah Rosenthal, who will introduce our guest speaker tonight. Father Patrick Dubois is one of my personal heroes. I met him in Buenos Aires many years ago, where he was helping the people there, trying to figure out how to find the disappeared from the dirty war in Argentina and beyond. He's a legend to many around the world. You've probably seen him a few times on 60 Minutes, and if you haven't, you will tonight. Father de Bois' calling is unique. His mission is to find the previously unknown graves of our families and our extended families who died without anyone to remember them. So we have had, we the Federation have led, two trips to Eastern Europe with Father de Bois to dedicate the mass graves and to finally say Kaddish and remember their sacrifice. The lessons of the Holocaust are many. The Holocaust taught us that it is possible. The depths of human evil, how deep we can sink. And we also know another lesson, and that is that the Holocaust happened because of unchecked hatred. We all must call out and confront hatred wherever it may be. The rise in anti-Semitism and other hatreds in the world reminds us of the lessons we have not learned. Father de Bois' mission is our mission, and to give honor and meaning to their lives and their deaths, and to ensure that the crimes of genocide will not happen again. It is my special honor to welcome Father de Bois again to Milwaukee to help us officially open the Holocaust by Bullets exhibit from his book, Holocaust by Bullets, and it will be open through May. His work is not easy, but it is critically important. This is such a special opportunity you have tonight to hear about what is happening with his work and to find those mass graves in our minds and hopefully 
standing next to them. And to translate his techniques and his passions to help those who are victims of today's genocide, welcome my dear friend, Father Patrick Dubois, right after we see this video. <laughs> Cue to video. <laughs> The Holocaust is marked and memorialized at places like Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, Dachau, but nearly half of the six million Jewish victims were executed in fields and forests. Good evening, everybody. So, the first question that people ask is why the French Catholic priest, why today 25 young people from many countries in Yahad are working in Poland, Lithuania, Russia, Belarus, Romania, Moldavia, etc. So I will explain you, because I know you are the public who knows the story. The first, it began by a family story. My grandfather was deported from France to Ukraine as non-Jew in a small village called Rabaruska and he never spoke. He passed away, and one day I decided to go back to Ravaruska, and I discovered that in the village they shot 80,000 Jews. By the way, I see people standing, and here there are at least 10 chairs free. It's like in the church, you know, people are afraid, so you can come to the front. I am not dangerous, so please come. I will feel more comfortable. There are places in the front, a minimum 10 chairs. It's for free. You can, come. you can come, you can come, please. Please, please. There's no shame to, to be in front. I think it's the same as a synagogue. <laughs> so I wait, I wait the people to be seated. I don't like to speak in front of people standing. Thank you. My conference is a little bit long, so. Thank you so much. So, it was a family story. I went back to Ravaruska, and uh, nobody wanted to say even there were Jews in the city. When you asked the population, it was Soviet time, they say no. We don't know. We don't know. I say, but well, the city was mainly Jews, 75%. Yes, but they, they have been taken in truck, and we never know where they have been sent, and we saw no shootings. And so, you know, me, I am from a small village where we killed the two Germans, and everybody knows it. So here they killed 18,000 Jews in the village, and nobody knew. But the Cold War was like that. Nobody wanted to speak. Suddenly, time passed away, and the Soviet lost. And the mayor brought me in a forest with 50 farmers present at the killing. And these farmers were old, began to speak, and it was the beginning, you know, I understood suddenly that the Jews were killed in public. And since this day, before, I always learned Jews were killed in secret. So I remember the first man he spoke, he said a German arrived with 30 Jews, you know, with, sorry, he arrived alone with a motorcycle, and he turned in the village. So people were wondering why they sent one German. In fact, now we know, with Yarad studies, that they sent a specialist of the digging. He's an architect. So his job is to calculate the volume of the mass grave according to the number of people they want to kill. So normally he goes to the city hall and he asks how many Jews are still alive. And he will calculate. You must know there are two kinds of mass grave. There are mass grave where they, they, they kill people from the top and they fall down. <coughs> And there are mass graves when they force the Jews to go down, it's called sardine and pacum. They had to lay on the corpse. Effectively, the day after, three Germans arrived with 40 Jews, and they forced them to dig. So it took one day and a half to dig. So the Germans began to be buried. So they wanted a table that they asked to the village, and they put a gramophone, all the people know what it was, to listen to German music. 
And one, he played harmonica, and he broke his harmonica. And later, us with, metal, with metallic detector, we found the harmonica. After, the German began to be hungry. So they asked to the village two chicken that we grilled. And they said to the Jews, now you are tired, you should go out of the grave and take rest. And so the 30 Jews went out and sat on the grass. At that moment, an Ukrainian policeman went down and he put explosive under the ground. After a certain time, they said to the Jews, now you go, you finish digging. Of course, the 30 Jews exploded. At that moment, I will never forget an old lady called Maria. She had a blue scarf. And she came and she said, Father, the German told me, come, come. And she had to climb in the trees to pick up the pieces of corpse of the Jews and to hide them with branches so that the next Jews will not see them. And after they brought trucks and trucks and trucks of Jews. In one day and a half, they shot 1,500 Jews. It was the end of the Jews of Ravaruska. With two shooters and three pushers. Why pushers? Because the army was not happy of the shooting of the Jews. So the army says to these units, one bullet, one Jew, one Jew, one bullet, no more. So if one Jew was young, baby, or only injured, or old, he was pushed and buried alive. And effectively, in that village, they said, it took three days the mass grave to die. Now, we know that because we have interviewed 5,000 people, and all the people said the mass grave was moving during three days. It was a shock for me. I was alone, Yahad, my organization didn't exist. I had no camera. I was not ready to listen to such story. I was a parish priest, so not ready for that. And I came back to the car with the, the mayor, and he told me this phrase I will never forget. He told me, Patrick, what I did for you for one village, I can do for 100 villages. And I will never know why he said that, and I will never know why I said yes. It was for me like God's call. I went back to Paris. I spoke to Cardinal Lustiger, who was Jew by family, Cardinal of Paris. He told me, oh, Patrick, I know the story, because my Polish Jewish family has been shot the same way in Beijing in Poland. I went to New York. We knew nobody. I met the manager of the World Jewish Congress, and he didn't know I was speaking Hebrew. So I heard he said to another one, you know what? We are looking for his mass graves in 44, and this guy that we don't know, he finds them. <laughs> so we organized a secret meeting between Lustiger and Singer in a suburb of Paris, and we built this non-profit called Yahad Together in, in uh, Hebrew and Inunum Together in Latin. I remember Cardinal Lustiger said, we cannot say Unum because we are not one, but we are in one, and one is God. So it's a complicated name, because when you speak to Jews, they always ask, why Inunu? When you speak to Catholics, they say, what is Yahad? <laughs> and, and when you speak to non-believers, they understand nothing. <laughs> so it's complicated for us. And now that you work in Iraq, it's more complicated. And I tell you the truth, uh, we were thinking to make free for travels. Because we imagine it, that was one mass grave here, and the next one, 100 kilometers, the next one. But after one year, we're still in the same district. There is one mass grave every hamlet. Ukraine is like a huge century. One million point eight Jews only in Ukraine have been shot. So we decided to build Yahad. So Marco arrived by Providence. He was working for the church. And Marco, you can stand up and show yourself. He's the director of the house. You can applaud because he represents the 28 people. You know, people see always Father Patrick, Father Patrick. You know, they imagine I carry, I drive five cars myself, three cameramen. And, no, I have a team like Anna, she has a big team. We have a small team, but they are 25 full time. Young people, I have the old guy now. And so, we had to build a methodology to investigate. So we had to find Soviet archives, German archives, to crisscross, knock at the door, and find the people. After 15 years of work, 
she said it's a publicity 10 years because uh, she, Anna and me, we think we are young, but it's 15 years of investigation. <laughs> and uh, so I will explain you the methodology of the German. The German decided which village to kill. The Germans were living in big cities, not in the village. So they phoned the local administration and said, you have to prepare the mass grave. They sent an architect, as I told you, he will calculate the mass grave, the size, etc. When they are ready, they phone to the region, the mass grave is ready. You must know that to dig a mass grave, it needs 200 people sometimes. So the Jews in the ghetto, they see that the farmers are going and coming with their spades to dig graves. I remember a village when a mother sent her child out of the ghetto and asked the family, is it for us, the grave? And you know, sometimes the local said yes, sometimes the local said no. When the mass grave is ready, the German decides the day. They announced to the shooters who will be shooter tomorrow, because in the German, you were not shooter every day. One day you could be shooter, one day you could be cooker or driver. So they said, you, 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 you tomorrow. At 4 o'clock, you must be ready in the trucks with your gun and your cartridges. When the German, they know they will be shooting tomorrow a drink. Because they do that many times. They have to wake up at 4 o'clock, climb in the trucks, they don't know the destination, and they drive to the village to be at the village at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning. What we discovered in Yarad is that the night before the shooting, it was a terrible night for the Jews. Because the neighbors knew it was the last night they could do something to the Jews. So it was legal that the police could rape the Jewish girls in the ghetto. So the morning, the police said, I could rape five, five girls, six girls, etc. And also some families entered in the ghetto to take belongings. I interviewed an old lady in Belarus. She told me that she knew the shooting would be for tomorrow, so she entered in the ghetto to take belongings of the Jews. So it's a, the night before the shooting is a nightmare. When the Germans arrive in the morning, they announce to the Jews, don't worry, don't worry, you will be deported to Palestine, or to Kiev, or to work. And you know, these people were in the Soviet Union, so Stalin was very strong in deportation, so announce the deportation was not a good news, but it was not necessarily the death. And they said to the Jews, to prepare yourself, you have to take all your belongings, because you will go far away. Take your money, everything, your keys, and everything. So the Jews make a huge line in the middle of the city, and they force them to walk five per five to count them. Because the unit of killers, they may, must make a rapport to Berlin to say how many Jews have been killed. The Jews sometimes wait two, three hours because the Germans are working with local police and if they find a Jew who is hidden in a house, they will shoot him. So at the end, it's a long line of Jews and of dead Jews. Suddenly, when German arrived, they said, direction Palestine. The trick of the German is to dig the mass grave in the direction of the train station. So the Jews were really thinking to take the train. I will give you an example. In Babiyar, in Kiev, they killed 35,000 Jews in three days. So when they sent them, they, they told them they would deport them. So 10,000 Jews went directly to the train station <laughs> and not to the grave. And so Germans say, they believe it, they believe it. So they have to send units to bring them back to the mass grave. <coughs> so the Jews began to, wee, to walk, and suddenly, no more train station. Links rushed, it's finished. So the Jews now understand they will be killed. So the girls take their jewels and throw them not to give to the German. The man tried to destroy their money not to give to the German. So us with metallic detector, sometimes we find 10, 20 wedding rings. Sometimes we find star, Magan David, medallion. So for me it's very moving because it's the last jest that this girl did in 42. But it's also an evidence that the victims are Jews because we have to fight the deniers. After we ask them to sit on the ground and to undress, and they will isolate them five per five or 10 per 10. Why five? Five Jews, five shooters. One bullet, one Jew. 10 Jews, 10 shooters. 
the same evening, they will bring back all the belongings of the Jews and sell them by auction. And after, empty the houses and sell the belongings by auction. So after three weeks in a classic village, there is no more belonging, no more suits, no more Jew. And you, you must understand it was Soviet Union, so the houses were not the property of the owner, but property of the state. So it stays nothing. They began the first day of the war, and they finished the last day in 44. These mass graves are from Lithuania to Azerbaijan. It's a continent of mass graves. For the moment, Yahad has found 1 million point four Jews. It stays 1 million to find. It's why we are racing against time, why we are raising money, because in four years it's finished. The Jews will not find, will never be found. Because in Russia, they make no memorial. Because they say these Jews were refugees, in fact. They were not local Jews, they are not our Jews. Why do we do that? The first reason, it was, it was a crime. It was a crime committed against his people. Every Jew saw his killer, every killer saw the, his victim. And if we accept to build Europe, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, on thousands of mass graves of Jews, how can we save something to act to a genocide if it was nothing to kill two million point four Jews? So for me, it's always a surprise. You find money to buy a build a huge museum, but not to bury the people. So I say that because for the deniers, you know, we can say it's a wonderful example. Jews are so connected to their dead, and suddenly they don't bury them. So the biggest challenge was to bring back the Jews to their mass graves. It was not easy. It was not easy. Now more and more families go back themselves, pay a flight ticket, say Kaddish for the first time, and made the family memorial. And we have hundreds of families. I pay somebody full time in Yarad only to answer to the families. After such a conference, we receive always emails in which mass grave is my grandma, in which mass grave is my uncle, in which mass grave is my rabbi. You can ask that through the website. We don't charge money for that, it's not to raise money, it's to help you reconnect for the dead. Because the dead has been cut from your family. The second thing, the dead have been cut from the Jewish people. People say six million, not counting all this huge number of Jews shot. And the last thing is that now time is going. We have to teach Holocaust in another way. I am teacher and professor in Georgetown. I have 72 students this year mostly non-Jews, and I teach the crime from the beginning to the end. Why people come to learn Holocaust? Because they know that actually there are still mass crimes. They know that there is no Hitler fatigue. Hitler is known all over the planet. Mein Kampf is printed in every language. I was recently in Iraq, I went to the Central Bazaar, I could find 10 books of Hitler, 10 different books pro-Hitler. Hitler is known and is a reference today. Stalin is not the reference. Mao is not the reference. It could be, but it's, it's no more. But Hitler, for a mass killer, is a reference. I don't know if you remember when Ahmadinejad was president of Iran, he made a mondial meeting of deniers, but of deniers of genocide of Jews, not, of gen de not deniers of Armenians or deniers of Rwanda, because genocide of the Jews is a reference for the mass killers. So also, after Yarad began to be like a specialist of the shooting of the Jews, one day I was in State Department where I met Anna, and she gave me an award. I will never forget, suddenly in the middle of the ceremony, a guy stood up, his name was Greg, and he asked me, would you accept father to do the same in Guatemala? I said, Guatemala? Because Marco is from Guatemala, I say, he's the guy from CIA to ask me that. Yeah. And so we met Greg, and he said, we would support you if you make the, jo the job in Guatemala, because in Guatemala there's a long conflict, and there is no human dimension in the burial, and so on. Would you accept? We decided finally to go to Guatemala, and we began the same investigation about the conflict, the conflict which finished in 96, where you are victim on both sides, and we discovered the same story. The killer came in the morning, 
sometimes with planes and helicopters, sometimes in trucks, saying to the people, don't worry, we are not for, to kill you, we are only to move you. And at the end was a shooting. So we decided to build an Holocaust Museum in Guatemala. It's the first Holocaust Museum in, in Central America. And as in Guatemala, it's a law to study Holocaust. We are overcrowded by young people because they are sent by the state. Every public school comes to visit the museum. It could have stopped here. You know, small organization, 25 people, 2 million point for Jews, research in Guatemala, research for the gypsy. But suddenly, I saw the news. It was in 2014. I saw that ISIS was coming in some territories and taking all the group of Yazidi. Who are the Yazidi? I never heard about them. It's a group who is believing in the light, in the sun, Zoroastrian, very, very old people, not Christian, not Muslim, and always having refused to convert to Islam. And they were condemned to death by ISIS. <clears throat> I looked at the TV. It was after I, I listened to the Pope. The Pope always said, you know, we are persecuting Christian overpopulation in the Middle East, and nobody cares, and nobody cares, and nobody cares. I took time to pray, two, three days. I took my decision. I say, I will go to Iraq. I remember I came back to the office. Marco was like that. Say, we have to do Iraq now. And so uh, we had no entry. We knew nobody. And to go to Iraq is not, as you imagine, easy. After Providence arrived, like always, I was in Brussels, and my bear was not good. So I say, I, I need to see her dresser. And people told me it's very late, you know, because I say, yes, but I have a meeting tomorrow morning. So they say, there is only one Arab dresser who is open. I say, I don't care. I went there, and I asked the guy, where are you from? The dresser told me, I'm from Iraq. And suddenly told me, I am Yazidi, and my father is teaching English in the refugee camps. Ah. For me, it was new God's call. I say, I found the door. Now the addresser is the best investigator working full time for Iraq. <laughs> I'm sorry for you if you look for a dresser. Finished. <laughs> so, and we built a team to investigate in Iraq. I will show you the second 60 minutes. You know, people were thinking I paid the team of 60 minutes because they made two emissions in six months. So I can tell you I didn't pay them. And um, we were the first team to investigate what happened because, in fact, ISIS is making the same thing that Hitler did with the Jews. They are killing the Yazidi. They are harassing and killing many Christians. They are killing the gay people. They are killing anybody who is not like them in the complete silence of the planet, like it was in 42. <coughs> so we have been with a special Yara team dedicated only to Iraq. We have been eight times, and normally, if God's will, I will be in two weeks in Iraq again with another team, but for Christians. So we discovered the methodology of ISIS, very simple. <coughs> when we arrive in these regions, they block all the streets and they ask the people, you have to convert to Islam or to die. Majority of people say, okay, we are Muslims. You have to put a white flag on your house and after, don't worry, don't worry, you will be convocated to administration because you need to have new papers. You remember they did the same for the Jews, convocate to administration. So, you know, people have no choice, they go to administration. The building of administration in Iraq are huge. So in all the communities the administration building, they close the door, and here they enter. So first, they will take all the newborn babies, take out from their mother, put in a truck, and they will give them to Islamic family. Until now, no mother could find any baby, because you know, after, completely disappear. After, they will bring doctors because they want to check which girl is virgin or not. So the mothers, when they say, see they will take their girls, they take their wedding rings and give to the girl and give a baby to make think they are a mother. That's why they call doctors and one by one the girls are checked. If the girl is virgin, 
she separated with her mom, put in a bus, and they will be sold by group. Somebody can buy 200, 300, and after they will sell them one by one. The women who are not virgin are isolated with the children, also sent in other buses, and they will be used as waiters, servants, or as human sheep. The very old people who cannot walk or who are sick are isolated and shot in mass graves. The men are separated from the children, also doctors are checking with a man and with a child. If a boy is classified as a man, he will be shot in mass graves too. And if he's classified as a boy, they will take this boy and send them in terrorist camps. We have interviewed now 140, 50 people. It's difficult to imagine because when a girl comes out, she has been sold sometimes 15 times. They buy them, rape them sometimes, and sell them the day after asking for more money. So the girl, she doesn't even know what happened. She has been forced to take drugs, to accept, to be raped. Beautiful girls are given to the authority of Daesh, of ISIS. And so it's terrible detail. These leaders of ISIS don't want the girl to remember she has been raped. So they bring her to hospital. She will be under anesthesia and raped under anesthesia. And when she wakes up, she's raped, so it's finished. She's his wife. I will give you testimonies of one girl. She was sold to an Islamic judge. So her husband told, he told her, change your name. I say, which name they gave you? And it was very moving for me because she told me I have been named Sarah. And she was forced to have the niqab. Every morning she left the house he was driving, went to a prison, make torture, and decided death penalty for the people. Only in Alep, she saw 75 beheadings done by her husband. And then she went in eight months, she did that. So imagine when she was free, the difficulty to speak. Because she has been changed her name, changed her religion, forced to be with a man doing awful things. The boys also who are liberated is difficult. We were with Marco in Iraq, and suddenly we have been told that one boy was liberated. He was nine years old. So two years of terrorist camps. Imagine a boy nine years old. So it was very strange, he was very small, and first he opened his jacket and he said, I received a bomb from the coalition and they had to bring me to hospital. So he had a now full chirurgical intervention. After he said, what do you want to know? You know they speak like adults being children. They are brainwashed. He didn't remember his language. He spoke only Arabic. The family doesn't speak Arabic, they speak only Kurdish. Every 10 minutes, he was stopping to speak, and he said, Allah Akbar, long life to Baghdadi. And at the end, he approached my cameraman, and he said to my cameraman, give me your bag, I will blow you. These children who are liberated are completely brainwashed. And so we decided, Yarad, to pay two free psychologues to try to help them reintegrate their identity, because all these children one day will be accepted as a refugee and they can be used by terrorist networks all over the planet. Who is ISIS? It's complicated. It's not a local organization. We have nearly 1,000 French in ISIS, engaged in ISIS. There are people from Germany, people from Belgium, people from Holland, people from Australia, people from Sweden, from Norway, people from your country, America, black and white. I see here, we never speak about them, but we are always testimonies of Americans on the ground until now, <coughs> converted in ISIS. People from Canada, and of course, people from all the Arab countries. People from Sudan, people from Libya, people from Tunisia, from Iraq, from Syria. We, we list at least 20 countries engaged in ISIS. They have a long-term vision. It's why they had so many terrorist camps, because they say we'll be defeated but the children will stay terrorists and will prove themselves here and there. Why do we do that? You know the situation of France has changed. I don't know if you listen to the news, but we 
always wondering where will be the next shooting, where will be the next attack. Same thing in France now, same thing in Brussels, same thing in Germany, same thing in Western Europe. And all these people, before shooting, make a video, say, fidelity to ISIS. You had only a few shootings here, one in Orlando, one in Berlin, San Bernardino, San Bernardino. So, but for us, it's daily life, it has changed completely the life in my country. If you go to Notre Dame now, you will have to wait nearly for sometimes one hour to enter because you have to show your bags to army, not to police, to army. It's a huge changement. So, we are doing that because the disease is going on. And you know, when we teach Holocaust, you speak of bystanders, upstanders, all these small lessons, it's very nice. But today, genocide are still on the planet. And we cannot say, I didn't know. You open your TV, you open internet, you open our website in Yaran, you will see a lot of news. But people sleep, like in 42. Because as long as it doesn't reach my family, my group, my city, where is the problem? It was the same. I understood now very well what happened in 42. People came back, say it's a mondial war, we are killing the Jews and the Gypsy. People say it's very sad, you know, for Jews and Gypsy, but I'm not Jew, I'm not Gypsy, and there is a mondial war, so we cannot take care of everything. And I wouldn't like that in 20 years we meet here and we make a commemoration of genocide of Yazidi with one survivor. We must act before it's finished. We must not wait. We cannot wait the genocide to be finished. So it's why also we are raising money for that. It's a strange adventure. Now also the church pushed us to make a statement about what happened really to the Christian. I don't know if you listen to the news, but Passover was not really good Passover in, in, in Egypt. Many Christians died. No news about the killers. I will finish by something a reflection. This genocide is happening now, I don't know if you realize, there is nobody guilty. You see 40 dead, 200 dead, 1,000 dead, but we have not one name of people accused of genocide on all the planet. They are all only accused of terrorism. So even if they have killed 1,000 people, 200 people, if they have sold the girls day and night, they will be accused of terrorism. So we are fighting in my organization that people be confronted to judge in our country, in France or in Germany, so that they can be accused of genocide, really. Otherwise, why, why Nuremberg? So I would say we do that now because we have to do that. We do that also because now we are attacked. In my country, we are attacked. They kill the priest during a mass. And all the churches for Passover were protected by army. Imagine in France 10 years ago, if you were to think that it needed army to make Passover in France. Imagine. Imagine the situation. So we are not in the question of refugees that you are here in the political debate. We are far from that. We are only confronted people who are acting a genocide against everybody who is not like them. Thank you. Right. <laughs> 
I can tell you as a priest, no, no, today I will not interview killers in Paris because we are in the, in the line. I met a few killers, you must not arrive late, so the line of Yara is more to interview the neighbors who are present because most of the killers, they didn't stay in the country. Soviet Union was very tough, so they went to Canada or to other countries in this continent. So if I had to find people, I should be in Canada, Chile, Argentina, etc. And I cannot be everywhere. No, I, I interviewed one or two killers, but uh, mainly we, we interviewed the neighbors. The neighbors. Because they were here to dig, to make all the dirty jobs, dig the most grave, fulfill the most grave, etc. And they want to speak. Also, you know, we work in countries who are difficult, like Russia and so on. So if we found one killer from this country, it would be very complicated. Your work is emotionally draining, what you do. I don't see you, are you? It's emotionally draining, listening to this death and destruction all the time, yeah. imagining the most awful scenarios, horrible things. How do you cope with that? It depends. We are 25, as I told you. So it depends. Each one has his way. Me, I have a psychoanalyst who helps me. Otherwise, I would jump from the window. And uh, also, I have a prayer. And, uh, Without the prayer, I couldn't stand, I think. So uh, both, but I have to be a realist because it attacks you. Because uh, each person of my team has listened minimum thousand of killings, minimum thousand. And uh, uh, I give you an example. I was in Iraq and there was a, a lady, she was looking completely depressed. She had her eyes down, she couldn't watch us. And I, I, was, I was thinking she make a strong depression. So we began to interview, to interview, and she, she was with a little girl, eight years old. And suddenly I began to think, and the girl, so I, I told her very quietly, and your girl, and she suddenly asked her girl to go out of the place, and she said, my girl is the only survivor of a rape of girls of eight years old. So she has been raped by five men, and now she doesn't accept to take a shower, she doesn't accept to be touched, she didn't accept to be naked in front of me. I cannot even speak about that, although she will feel anything. We are so embarrassed. We have seen this girl one hour before with her mom and realizing she has been raped by five men, eight years old. I say that because that's the kind of story we have to carry. A genocide is a crime. There is no limit. No limit. Excuse me, do you have any thoughts about pedophile Wait for the microphone. Thank you, Father. What would we be interested to know that you learned from German and Soviet government archives? In the Soviet archives, in 1944, they went in every village, they reopened the mass graves, and they come to court, they make medical legal statements, and they interrogated the people. 17 million of pages. We have a copy of these pages in the Holocaust Museum of Washington. We have a good cooperation with them, and so we scan them and send them to Paris, we translate them, and it gives a mapping of the mass grave most of the time. And for the German side, it's justice archive. It's more complicated because there are injustice. So, but we know also the name of the killers through the German archives. So we crisscross that. And after we go on the ground. The Soviet archives are very useful. Microphone here. I may not need the microphone, I'll just try to project. But your images here and, uh, and your, your talk about this reminded me of a recent article in a national newspaper here, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, earlier this week talked about the discovery of perhaps hundreds of mass graves uh, in an area where Boko Haram had been, yeah. uh, which apparently was seemingly unknown, but now they're just uncovering one after another and another. I know, but it's very dangerous to go. So even if you find me money, I will not go. Uh, because uh, it's very dangerous because Boko Haram 
is very wide, his territory is not clear, and uh, I couldn't go as a white person in the Haram territory, I, I would disappear myself. So I, uh, because of, we are protected by my government, my institutions, and uh, we ask and advise when we go somewhere, we cannot say, oh, I go where. Boko Haram is extremely dangerous. And also the roads are not good, so you cannot drive quickly outside. And uh, I couldn't go in Boko Haram territory, but you are, Boko Haram is, is the same connection with ISIS, it's the same ideology. It's in Nigeria, Nigeria and Cameroon. They took also a lot of girls, but now, you remember the campaign where, bring back our girls, you remember? Even Mrs. Obama has this t-shirt, but now no more t-shirts and the girls never came back. So I say that because try never to enter in a campaign for nothing. Because it's terrible for the victims. Bring back our girls and have to baptize the girls. Father, yes. I'm sure that you love your country. Are you sometimes are you concerned that with the decades in Western Europe and in France of a population growth that doesn't replace the population, and with an influx of Muslim immigrants, and with a high birth rate of Muslims in France and in the rest of Western Europe, are you concerned that Western civilization in Europe is in jeopardy in the near future or the not so distant future? Yeah, I understand your question. You would be very happy to be French because in four days we have elections, so I see for who you would vote. But uh, <laughs> I can't use the list. We have one candidate which this kind of song. It's complicated because in France, when you speak about that, it means you are ultra right because it's only Mrs. Le Pen who speaks about that. She's a fascist, so it's complicated. So the church has to be careful. But I understand what you say. You must know, don't ask me any political question because I don't want to lose my visa. Uh, so don't ask me about Putin. I don't know anything about Putin. I don't know anything about the president of Iraq. I don't know anything about Trump. I have a visa. So, I have a, so don't ask me anything about that. I'm not a question. You must understand if I take position in any of this debate, uh, in, two day, in 10 days, I, I'm waiting for my visa from Iraq. So uh, every country now is listening <coughs> anything about what you say. We are in a unique world now. When you don't travel, you have big, at, you, you know what you think, but when you have to go everywhere, you think much less. <laughs> <laughs> One last question. Free hands. One question. <laughs> Hi, Father De Bois. So I'm wondering with all of the um, documentation of the evidence of the crime and the genocide and the Holocaust were criminal, um, is there some sort of trajectory in terms of litigation or reparations or other than the, the wish and the mission to prevent more genocide, are there any other sort of pathways to um, consequences that you see from the documentation of this evidence. It's complicated. First we have to teach. We have to teach in a new way. Because you know people say why, I, I listen to some questions sometimes, why you teach only about the Holocaust of the Jews? Many genocide arrived after and you don't speak about them. And you listen frequently to this question outside your Jewish circles. First I realized that people who raise this question don't work on any other genocide. But Nevertheless, it's a question. So you are, we, are, we are not in the same period. As I say, Elivism died. And for me, it would be before Elivism death and after. Until Elivism was with us, we had the face. All the planet knew Elivism. All the planet, not only the Jews, everybody. He was the face of the victim of Auschwitz. Today, there is no mondial face. We are in a new epoch, a new a new time. So either you teach Holocaust, I will be very rough, because they killed Jews. It will be a unique reason. Either you teach Holocaust, because unfortunately, Holocaust is a reference today for the mass killers. So you teach Holocaust to heal the planet. So either you teach Holocaust open eyes to the future and to the planet. 
I will you teach Holocaust only because they were Jews. So for that, if you teach Holocaust because they were Jews, sooner or later, you are isolated. People will say, OK, you care, you care for your victims, but the rest you don't care. But in fact, Holocaust, today we are in a meeting like that. I'm sure that in some countries, there are other meetings with people who are pro-Hitler, pro-genocide, and who are advocating for that, for mass crimes. I never saw a terrorist who is against Hitler. I never saw terrorists in the Islamic world who is loving the Jews. You must understand there is a connection, an historical connection. So our organization is working both. We are working for the genocide of the Jews mostly, genocide of gypsy but nobody cares, genocide of disabled people but nobody cares, and after Guatemala a victim but nobody cares, and now victim of Iraq that very few people care. So I say, the Jewish population is surely today in the planet the population who is the more sensitive to accept, to recognize the genocide, because they know what it is. They will see or they also remember the silence in 42. I don't know if you read the recent articles, but recently they opened the archives of United Nations this week. And they realized that every nation in 42 knew everything about the Holocaust of the Jews. But it was the war. Today, if you go to the United Nations, you will have the same song to say, there is a war. Do not move for a genocide. So I would say, you the Jews, us the Christians, we were reconciliated by Vatican II, by the Pope, by the different rabbi who worked a lot. But we have now to stand together. People are dying today. People are killed today. We will not be able to say we did not know. We will never, you know, the first question of God in the Bible is, where is your brother? So you, me, we will pass away. And when we arrive on the other side of the river, we listen to this question, where is your brother? So it's why we ask for help from you. We, we cannot stand alone in this field. It's a killing field of the planet. It's four hours of Paris, Iraq, only four hours. So I would say pray for us, and for the people who can help us, help us, we need you. Thank you.